Hello, and welcome to our October webinar. As I mentioned before we begin, I would like to ask everybody to make sure that their, mucus, their mic is muted to reduce background noise for the webinar today. Uh, this month, we are pleased to present a discussion on the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. In September 2016, the National Baseball Hall of Fame Museum launched their first online collection entitled Pastime, which provides a window into the illustrious career of the great Bambino, Babe Ruth. Discovery Garden Solutions architect Stephen Perkins is with us today and will provide a high-level presentation about the project and will showcase various custom features that have been implemented along the way. I want to let you know, as you heard, that we are going to be recording this webinar and I'll send out a link to access it later on today. So my name is Adam Smith. I've met a lot of you and I look forward to meeting more of you in the future as we continue to develop projects. I'm a sales and marketing associate here with Discovery Garden. I joined the team in 2015 and I've been immersed in a broad range of Island Order projects. As I mentioned, I've dealt with many of you online here today, but as we move forward, um, I hope to uh, deal with you all in the near future. So as always, we're going to start with an overview of Island Dora and Discovery Garden, which will lead into the main presentation. Following that, I'll open the floor to any questions and I'll ask that you continue to leave your mics muted uh, and type your questions into the chat window and I'll read them out loud for Stephen. So with that, let's begin. So as I mentioned, let's start by talking a little bit about Islandora for anyone who might be new to the community. So the Islandora open source technology stack consists of three core components, that being Drupal, Apache Solar, and Fedora Commons. The stack also includes a lot of utility components and dependencies as well. Islandora is a very large open soft source software stack and it includes many applications. So in essence, the developers of Islandora and the community that supports it are experts at integrating third party tools into Islandora. So let's talk a little bit about the core components individually and we'll start with Drupal. Many of you are familiar with Drupal as it is a leading open source content management system with over 30,000 user contributed modules from almost 100,000 active community members or developers. Active community members, as you know, are vital to any open source project, and the same can be said for Drupal. People are invested in Drupal, and that leads to ongoing development and ultimately success. So Drupal serves as the presentation layer in Islandora. It's how we create a website and how we expose it to the internet. We also use Drupal for collaboration. It is a great framework for users, roles, and permissions, and we use that for workflow activities, and it really does integrate in with a lot of other functionality within Islandora. So Islandora, in essence, is a suite of Drupal modules that allow us to build repositories on top of Fedora Commons. These modules make it possible to build, populate, and configure a digital repository without the aid of a developer. So next is Apache Solar. Apache Solar is used for discovery within Islandora. Solar is very powerful, flexible, and configurable. It's used on some of the most heavily trafficked websites and applications worldwide. Some key features include full text search, search faceting and filtering, it's highly scalable and fault tolerant, and provides near real-time indexing. For example, if we ingest an object into Islandora, it's going to be indexed within Solar almost immediately and will become searchable probably within 30 seconds after ingest. The final core component is Fedora Commons. Now this is the layer that stores and preserves all of our digital content. Fedora Commons is purpose-built for data preservation and long-term data accessibility. And key features include auditing and fixity checks, RDF, M, RDF XML support. Uh, we're able to scale Fedora Commons to millions of objects. It has support for virtually any file type, and it's built for interoperability. That means you can export or migrate your data in a format so that it can be stored elsewhere should you choose. So as mentioned, these three core components make up the open source technology framework. And we like to call it a framework as it really is the integration of components working together. Organizations all over the world are using the Islandora framework to build repositories. Now, some of these instances are customized in order to meet specific needs, and some are not customized as the software is very usable out of the box. People are scaling these repositories into the millions of objects, and they continue to have these large repositories perform very well. It helps to create fast, usable sites that are meeting customers' expectations. So let's talk a little bit about how Discovery Garden fits into the overall picture. So Discovery Garden is a service provider of Islandora. Now we work to remove barriers to using the open source technology. We launched in 2010 and we are a partner in the Islandora Foundation, which is a nonprofit entity that fosters the code. So since we've launched, we've contributed to over 90% of the Islandora code base, 
which we've written here at Discovery Garden on behalf of our many customers. So we offer a lot of services that relate to an island or a repository, and a complete list of our services can be found on our website, and I'll include a link to that page in the follow-up package that I'll send out later on today. So moving on to the reason that we're all here today, as mentioned, Discovery Garden Solutions architect Stephen Perkins joins us today. Stephen is immersed in the Island Ore community and has been involved in numerous Island Ore projects ranging from consulting, custom development, and data migration, and serves as a project manager for the Baseball Hall of Fame project. So without further ado, I'll pass the presenter role over to Stephen. Bear with us for one moment. Okay, so I think okay, so I think are you able to see my screen, Adam? Yes, Stephen, I am. Yes. Fantastic, still loading here. Great. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. I'm Stephen Perkins. I had the privilege to be a solutions architect and the project manager for the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum uh, Digitization Initiative. And uh, I'm really pleased to, uh, that you've taken time out of your day to meet with us and, and to show you some of the work that was done. So the, the Hall of Fame embarked on an initiative to uh, engage in several things. They were going to define the use of open metadata standards for their information structures. They had a set of existing digital catalogs and information in various uh, applications. Um, they were going to embark on digitizing and preserving their holdings, which is a very large set. And to do that, they needed to implement a digital asset management system that would provide all the critical functions for ingest, management, discovery, and publication. Um, now, while Islandora offered a, a great deal of functionality, the library and museums presented uh, a unique case and some additional things that needed to be developed within Islandora. Uh, once development was completed, uh, we needed to look at migrating all of the legacy data into the new dams and also design and implement workflows that would support all of the functions. There were uh, a lot of uh, roles within the hall, the museum, and the library to accommodate. Uh, some commonality between their work and some different functions. So initially, this was going to be a very big repository. They have a lot of books, publications, media, ephemera, artwork. There's a tremendous amount of artifacts. It's, it's one of the richest uh, sets of things to be cataloged that I've ever seen. And it is a project of scale. We were definitely uh, starting big with an initial uh, development uh, goal of hitting three and a half million objects um, at the start that will scale considerably um, over the next uh, three to five years as the digitization initiatives continue. Now the drivers for them were to expand their audience and their brand recognition um, and, and participate more fully in the digital realm. Um, the system needed to support their preservation mission, which is to conserve and curate and catalog their collections. Um, there were a lot of disparate software and information storage systems in place uh, that had pain points. Uh, among them interoperability, there were license restrictions, license costs, um, access limitations, 
some redundancy, and some of them were just aging out. They were at the end of their life cycle. Another driver to address was to, to undo some of the silos of knowledge. Um, depending upon who had access to the systems or, or who knew what, there was a chance that not everybody within the hall's walls would be able to retrieve information related to their assets at any given time. So that might mean, well, I've got to go down and ask someone who, who does know. So the nice thing about having a DIMS is you can open up the access to everyone within the institution. So when we engage with a client like the whole on a really big project, we generally do something called an assessment. And this is where before any work begins, we go in and, and we take a look at two things mainly, where we're at, sort of what we call a current state at the start point, and then where we want to be. Uh, now at the Hall of Fame Museum, um, and the project start state, uh, they had a lot of internal tools. They were using Millennium, which is an, an iOS system um, that had a way of exposing its holdings to the web via a tool called Abner. They were using a collections management software called Proficio. This did some descriptive metadata storage, but held a lot about something that we'll, we'll see as we move along called procedural transactions. So if you're running a museum, you need to manage your accessions, who you've loaned things in and out from, uh, track donor information, conservation actions, these types of things. Things that are about the life of the object, but not, not necessarily um, it's a, descript a description of it. They use the OCLC connection tool for creating bibliographic and authority records um, and accessing WorldCat. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of uh, library science acumen at the whole. Um, they were running at, at baseballhall.org. They have a public facing web portal. And of course, we had to consider how we would interact with that. Um, Beacon is a mobile app that allows people to create sort of a themed experience on their journey to the road, uh, on, on journey to the hall. Um, it was desired to be able to take information from the Islandora repository and have that be available to be used by the mobile app. And last but not least, but was a, uh, an aging multimedia database called LibAV. And this is where information um, about uh, the, uh, the whole media assets was stored. So it's kind of a big picture. Um, and that's exactly what we make at the beginning. I like to always start with a context diagram. And so this is where we started. And on the left-hand side, you see the institutional stakeholders. We have people doing exhibitions and collections, people working in communications, sponsorship and development, retail licensing, finance and administration, which at the whole, their digital strategy arm is under. And the people in blue on the left are disconnected from the dams, from, from access to the digital assets. The people who did have access are in yellow. And so library collections, the curatorial people, and digital strategy did have access. But nobody, nobody within the institution that might have the ability to cultivate relationships with the, the, uh, the people that they reach that are on the right had access to these. So there are a set of uh, components of the system that I was just talking about that are illustrated in the middle. And you can see it's kind of a, a muddied picture where we've got a lot of places where assets are stored. There's not the ability to perform discovery over all of them. And there's sort of a complex set of interactions that don't necessarily reach everyone that we want to reach. So the idea was to start from here, knowing where we are, and decide how we could make effective use of Island Dora to reduce the amount of tools and increase the amount of access that we have and create workflows that work for all of the stakeholders, both internally and externally. So we start to design where that end state is today, um, where Island Dora stores all of the digital assets and metadata, also all of the procedural transactions. It interacts with the OCLC connections tool, which uh, there was no need to, to rebuild. There we built workflows so that all of the bibliographic records can be created in connections and ingested into Islandora. We have interactions uh, with authority checking services. Um, we're able to supply data to the mobile app, Beacon. And we interact with two sites. Um, for the time being, it was decided that Islandora and the collections would be mainly accessed through a research portal. That is now at collections.baseballhall.org. And over time, 
through an API uh, made uh, accessible by Islandora, those resources will become accessible in Baseball Hall. And probably, eventually, that will conflate into one domain. But in this phase of the project, they are two distinct sites. At this point in time, everybody within the walls has a role that allows them to search the assets. And we have ways of reaching all of our target audiences. So the requirements that we had that drove new development, as you know, as Adam alluded to, Islandora is open source, and in a large number of circumstances, it meets all of the requirements that people have, or about 90% or so out of the box. This is a big project that put made us foray into some new areas. So we did have some requirements that drove new development. One of them was preservation. The whole wanted to do dark archiving, meaning to have an archive for archival quality preservation assets outside of the repository that provided a lot of redundancy and security. So that drove the development of some backup modules we'll discuss in detail that allow us to automatically uningest, store and deep archive preservation assets. We needed to be concerned about performance. The Hall has a very big audience and they have a very active social media presence that can drive a lot of traffic. And also, they have a very ambitious digitization project. So we have two areas in the architecture that place a very big load on things. We've got a public web portal that needs to support a lot of uh, traffic. And on the back end, we need to be concerned with handling large ingests of uh, large binary files in quantity that doesn't slow down any access for people inside the walls or people outside the walls. So we'll take a look at that architecture design. Um, in the discovery department, we wanted to have the ability to do a synonym search. So a really easy example supplied from the hall by this is baseball didn't used to be one word. It was two words, baseball. But you want to be able to have people get hits when they search either one on the same term. So we developed Islandora synonym search. And also we developed the ability to share queries amongst internal users. This is nice for workflow or for sharing ideas between um, individuals uh, working at the institution. Now, Islandora, at the time we began work, didn't store library records, such as MARC records for bibliographic and authority holdings. So we developed content models and ingest workflows and metadata displays that allowed us to do this. There were also some special reports um, for instance, we wanted to be able to look at a bibliographic record for a periodical and have a report that showed us any of the serial holdings for that publication that the hall had within their walls. So this was created. Procedural transactions management. Again, Islandora didn't have a facility for managing transactions related to um, an artifact. So we did an integration of an open source standard for this type of information. It was developed by the Collections Trust. It's called Spectrum. And so now we were able to store that information, uh, display it, search it, and also build uh, XML forms in Islandora for people to do the data entry and update. We wanted to be able to do controlled vocabulary integrations. The whole uses Library of Congress and Getty AAT uh, vocabularies. So we wanted to be able to connect those to the forms so people could do lookups. And they have some unique compound ingest workflows that were interesting. In the case of the hall, um, we'll look at this in detail and actually walk through it, but there are objects where we may have multiple images for the same one. Further to that, some of them may be that the ones we want to publish and some of them may be for internal use only. So those of you familiar with Islandora's compound object ingests uh, before lately, it wasn't exactly the most friendly for getting this done. So we made some improvements to that to make it quicker and also to manage handling permissions without the user having to do any interventions. Um, there were a lot of various presentation requirements. We wanted to be able to link to fulfillment services to buy things. We wanted to be able to warn people when a media asset might contain adult content. Um, emphasize to people that if something is not necessarily accessible, as soon as you get there, uh, be able to tell them what the access conditions are for a particular artifact. Um, and also, we wanted to have different ways of 
viewing records between internal and external users. And along with that, we had various external applications to make sure that we could integrate with. So a lot of this was uh, cause development. So we're almost to the juicy part, but what I can't show you on the screen is how we handled the performance and preservation aspect. So what you're looking at now is a, is a simplified diagram of how we chose to address uh, dealing with the performance and space requirements and archival requirements. We, um, the first part of it was to set up a circular architecture. So we're using a separate public facing front end and this is used to serve the public. As such, it's tuned for that. It uses varnish and various caching settings to allow really speedy responses to queries and displays of objects on the front end. On the staff side, we used a server that's tuned for ingesting objects. So that has a different type of architecture that's designed to handle ingest of large amounts of big binary assets. That is loop. All of this uses a common uh, back end, which is where Fedora, MySQL, and Solar are installed. But doing it in this fashion allows us to isolate the public from the hit of the heavy ingests, and it allows us to tune the server architecture for the specific audience that it serves. As I said, we developed two modules, Islandora S3 Backup and Islandora S3 Jobs, and this handles the preservation component. So now, anytime anybody ingests an, island, uh, an object through the staff portal, automatically, and all of the derivatives that we need for interaction with the public or working, serving the staff are created, and the archival versions are staged for a backup into a very cost-efficient, redundant and self-healing storage in the Amazon Cloud Platform. So we temporarily store things for 24 hours in what we call an S3 bucket on Amazon. And then at the end of that, once we've secured that all derivatives has been generated, they are put into Glacier. It's a very, very cost-effective way to handle this type of storage. Something that we're working on that's ready to deploy in the next couple of weeks was also handling a large amount of media assets that are going to be coming their way. We wanted to be able to set up a streaming media solution pack. So this has just been completed this week. And this one is very effective generatives for our media assets, integrate them into the same preservation platform, and then serve them through the AWS CloudFront service. So essentially the path will be a media file will be uploaded, a transcoder job is created, the AWS Elastic transcoder will draw off the asset from its temporary S3 storage, make all of the encoded derivatives and make those available via the AWS CloudFront. So we'll have really quick serving of media assets. Once those derivatives have been created, there's a message that comes back to Islandora and stores the links to those streams within a data stream on the object within the Islandora repository. So these were the highlights of the architecture. Now let's get to the good stuff. You're still, still able to see my screen, Adam. Yes, we're still good, Steven. Great, thank you. All right, so moving to the live portion of this. Now I'm logged into the, the staff portal. And just for reference, you'll see that there's, I'm at the collections.baseballhall.org site. This is the public phrasing front end. And you'll see essentially two different Drupal interfaces for this. So on the front, if I'm the public, this is where I'm directed from the baseballhall.org site. And this has all kinds of content that the, the public will see, but of course they're only seeing what's made publishable and uh, controlled displays only show them the metadata that is considered uh, publicly publishable. On the back side, I'm logged into the staff portal, which we call ingest. So the ingest server is a bit different. I don't need a fancy UI. This is where we're working. So let's take a look at some of the features that we developed. So we talked about during the discovery having a synonym search. So now there's an Islandora synonym search module. And within the structure, if I select taxonomy, 
and I go to Islandora Solar Synonyms. You'll see that I'm allowed to build lists. Each of these lists allows me to create a map. So we call them left-hand terms and right-hand terms. The idea is that any term on the LHS terms here can be searched and a term on the right hand will be automatically searched as well. So it's basically a thesaurus search. We can create as many of these lists as we want. After we've created our list, we need to make Solar aware that we've created a list of synonyms that we want to use. So under the Islandora menu, I can go to the Solar Index and select Solar Synonyms. And here is where I make Islandora aware of the vocabulary that I want to use and apply that. And now my search will be updated. Anytime I search for awards, I'll also search for award. So this is a way of making sure that people that uh, just get the richest set of results that they know. Now we also have the ability to share queries. And this means that anytime I run a search, I'm just going to run a null search so I can show you the tool. You'll see that there's a block that appears here. This doesn't appear to the public. It only appears to authenticated users. All I have to do is type in a query name and hit the disk icon, and that will be saved in my bookmarks. So we integrated this into the bookmarks module. And anytime I want to access my shared queries, they're right here in the, in the bookmarks. And another neat feature is I can share these with other users. Now, in a big repository like this that's undergoing uh, constant updating, of course, the answer to your question can change. If I'm looking for everything I have on Mike Schmidt, that answer might be different uh, in October than it is in January. So this is one nice way to save things. Another nice thing is to be able to share them. Um, so somebody may ask you, you know, what do we have on Ernie Banks? I say, well, I'll run a search for you. I save that and send them that query. They can run it and see all of the assets related to it. I have the ability to, to manage these lists. So there's a full set of tools for sharing them with other users. I can manage them, give them a description, delete my list, save the name, or maybe I just want to re-execute my search. And there's everything I have on Ernie Banks. Something I hadn't put into the presentation, but I see and I'm reminded of now, is we also developed an Islandora default thumbnails. Uh, this is a, a module that allows you on a per collection basis to decide what you want to use for a default thumbnail. In this case, we have a lot of records at this point that we don't have images ingested for. So when we do have an image, you'll see them listed in the search results. But when we don't, this is actually a custom thumbnail icon that we wanted to use. So there's a new module for being able to configure that as well. Now let's take a look at the library management records, library records management functions. I'm going to browse on over to a test collection. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check that I'm able to use a particular content model that I want to use. This will give me a chance to show you the, the type of content models that we built. And if I look at a collection and I go to manage and I select collection, it will show me all of the content models that I'm allowed to use.
Among them, you'll see here, content models that we built for MARC authority records, bibliographic records, and holdings records. In the end, we ended up embedding holding records in the bibliographic records at the whole, but you could choose to do so separately and make compound records out of bibliographic items and their corresponding holdings records. It's all a matter of how you want to approach it. So if I want to add a, a bibliographic record, I just go to Manage on the collection. I select to add an object. I'm going to select the bibliographic content model. And we built some unique workflows. Sometimes, um, sometimes people were going to be building records in connection and then ex just save a MARC XML file and ingest it. But there were periodically times where the hall might be creating an authority record to, um, in, for internal use only, something that might not be loaded to the OCLC gateway. So we actually built uh, an XML form for creating MARC records. And as a result, the ingest is showing me a workflow. They're saying, well, do you want to fill out a form or do you want to upload an XML file? In this case, I just want to upload an XML file. Uh, grab a sample bibliographic record. I just upload that. Optionally, I can choose to associate an image with this record if I want to have a thumbnail. I'm going to skip that for the purposes of time, and all I need to do is hit ingest. And I'll talk uh, a little bit in detail, but this is also engaging in some custom work here, too. So when I'm ingesting this, it's actually looking at some fields in the MARC record to build. Uh, a record title. It'll take a second for Solar to, to update that. And so now the ingest has looked at the, the, the MARC fields 245A and, and B and created a title from that. And you'll see that there's a MARC metadata display. Now this is an internal use display. It's not super friendly, but the great news is that since we're just building this display from the MARC XML file, we can put an XSL, an extensible style sheet language transformation in there to make this look any way you want. You can give us a manifest of fields that you want to be displayed, how you want them formatted, and we're basically just building a web page out of it. As far as the, the way this content is modeled, you'll see that if I look at the data streams for the object, that there's now a MARC XML data stream. And that is where my MARC record resides. This is also editable. So one of the customizations that we did was to, as I said, to create the XML form. And so you'll see here that you're able to, it takes a second to load. It's, Rather massive. Those of you familiar with the MARC standard or know how verbose it is. Or should I say comprehensive? Mm -hmm. So I can expand any of the sections within this, make changes to the MARC record. This deals with repeatable and non-repeatable fields. And then update the record. Now, a couple other things happened. Um, speaking back to discoverability, we needed to find a, a common grammar through which we could do the indexing for the discovery because, well, we have artifacts that are being cataloged and those use the mods metadata standard. And then we have library records that are using mods. And then we also have the need to be able to perhaps share the data outside the walls via an open archives initiative feed. So on ingest, there's a set of crosswalks that take place for this. So there's a Dublin core record that's been created. 
and there's a mods record that's been crosswalked from the mark record when all of the fields that we need for indexing in solar for discovery are done. And this is what allows us to set up a federated search over different types of objects that are using different metadata standards. Before I leave here, um, I want to make one further point about the MARC metadata display, which is also to say that this display can be customized by user role. In the case of the hall, there were MARC, there was MARC uh, metadata that we only want to have viewable internally. Uh, so we were able to configure it so that unauthenticated users actually get a different display than the internal users. So that sort of covers the, the rough end of the library records. I'm going to move on now to procedural transactions records. Now, while we were looking at the data streams for this object, you may have noticed something called spectrum, and I referenced that earlier in the presentation. So looking at the data streams, you'll see, oh, well, here's my spectrum. And what this is, is this is the data stream that's storing our information about the last time this object was valued, the last time it went out for conservation, what happened, um, whether we've loaned it in or out, where did we accession it, when, who was the donor, this type of information. And by having it as a separate data stream, that is also information that we don't necessarily want to publicly expose. So using permissions, we're able to control internal versus external access to this type of information. Now the spectrum standard does allow us to store an XML data stream. There's a full schema for it. But of course, in Islandura, you don't have to subject anybody working with the data for that because if it's an XML, we can build a form for it. So we did just that. So when we're doing an acquisition at the hall, we're able to enter the accession numbers, the donor information, information about the acquisition dates. Any of this procedural transactions metadata can be entered using the Islandora XML forms. Also, because this is XML, we're able to repurpose the, the same way that we did the MARC metadata display to display the spectrum information. Now this will be rather concise as it's a new record I haven't entered any metadata into, but it will serve the point. So you'll see here that there's a block on the page called procedural transactions. Again, this block is controlled by permissions, therefore I can make it so it only appears for authenticated users, and all of the spectrum information will be displayed here. We've configured solar so that's accessible, and you'll see some of the search functions that that supports in just a little bit. So I'm going to move on now to looking at what we did with controlled vocabularies. And to do that, I'm just going to take a look at a test image that we have in here. And actually, um, maybe not. Let's put something new in. I think if we put something new in, we can see a little bit about the ingest workflows. So I'm in my test collection. If I want to add a new object, I just say I want to add a new object. Let's make it a large image. Now you see I'm getting a form choice here. As I said earlier, there are a lot of different roles within um, uh, the hall. So that might mean I'm either a photographer, I'm putting in an image, or I'm working in the museum, I have a new artifact I'm going to catalog. Depending upon the type of artifact, you may use different fields within the MODS metadata standards. So to make people really efficient at doing metadata entry, you have the ability to create multiple forms. And then depending upon their role or the type of object, they can choose the form that best suits the work that they're doing. I'm putting in an image, so I'm just going to take the default image selection. We'll just, I'm just going to enter a title. That's the only mandatory data. We can set up validation for anything that you want. And I'm going to scroll down to take a look at the subject section of this. Now you'll see the little circle on the right-hand side of these, and that indicates that these are connected to autofills. That means if I start typing, this is going to look at the vocabularies that are connected to this. 
And this was really interesting because of some of these are connected to multiple vocabularies. There are um, library, some, ones, some of them are connected to the Library of Congress mm -hmm. subject headings to, or to the name authority. But we also integrated a database called Baseball One, which is an open source database that is considered to be a, 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 an authority in this, in this subject domain. So there's actual multiple vocabularies being queried, and then I have my options to add subjects from those vocabularies. So once that's done, I've entered my metadata. Sorry, my cursor has gone uh, AWOL. I'm just going to upload. This is a TIFF file, so it'll, it'll take a moment. And once that upload is complete, I just in the ingest the objects. This is a great time to talk about some of the work that's happening on ingest. So a lot of work just happened, and you'll see the messages come up on the screen. I talked about the backup, the archival backup. So automatically, a copy of all the metadata and the archival asset and any derivatives has been bundled up and made and sent off to that staging area before it heads for the archival storage. All of them are also stored in the Islandora repository. And now we've got our picture of Frank, who's looking mildly concerned. And we can see his metadata. And a bunch of other things happen, too. Since he's a new asset, we've generated a spectrum data stream for him. So there's now a spectrum data stream that can be updated with the accession information. Um, and we also had some special derivatives requirements. When we talked about what we did or didn't want to store in the repository, uh, the hall always wanted to have access to a good print quality version of these images at about 300 DPI. So we were able to set up um, creation of that derivative automatically for them. And you also see that everything that's been created for presentation has been watermarked. And that happens automatically. And that's positioned correctly based on, uh, you know, scaling and positioning information that's in that procedure. Our mods data stream has been crosswalked into Dublin Core. So now that's available for the Islandora OAI module. And my work here is done. But putting in an image is um, relatively simple. So I want to take a look at another custom ingest workflow, which was how we created compounds. Now, previously in Islandora, when I created a compound, I would create a compound object. Then I needed to separately, in separate operations, create other objects, then associate them with the compound. So it's effective, and it's a really great way to model data. But the museum uh, people had a lot of compounds to build with a lot of images, and that workflow just wasn't going to cut it. It was too inefficient. So we gave it some thought um, and then said, OK, let's build a special tool for building compounds. So here you'll see something, an option called add a museum compound. And this is going to let me build a bunch of objects into a compound through a single interface. I'm gonna, I get my choice of forms again. I'm just going to call this my test compound. I'm going to select what we call the primary image. A primary image is 
the first thing you want people to see when they go to a compound record. In this case, we've got a, a ball that has some historic significance. It's an artifact that we're uh, creating. This is actually a fairly big file. It's going to take a minute to update. And when I pass this screen, we will enter. Uh, we will then go to a screen that allows me to add other images to the compound. And what's going to happen following that is it will create all of the records for me. It will create all of the relationships between the compound object and the children that it comprises of. And it's going to do some permissions management for me. Because at the whole, we have something called reference images, which are for internal use only. And I don't want the public to see those. But again, in the past, I would have had to go and set the permissions and policies on those objects separately. This ingest will automate all of that work. So that's finished uploading. And now we've got a GUI that we built that let people drag and drop to build compounds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a couple of uh, reference files to this. Thankfully, they're just little JPEGs, so they'll take just a minute. But this could be, it could be two files like I'm doing here. It could be six. It could be 20 files. All I need to do is feed them. They will be uploaded. And now the real work begins. So I select ingest. Individual records are being created for the three objects, the primary image, the uh, two reference images that I've added, it'll take a moment for those derivatives to be completed in the indexing, and now I have my updated object. So when I view a compound object, on the right hand, there's a sidebar that displays all of the other objects associated with it. So in this case, we see that nice view of the, the ball itself. And then there are other pictures that only the staff internally will see that show its display. So that's a good example of a, of a custom ingest workflow that can help people to be more efficient and automate a lot of effort. Now, to go through... Uh, just a last couple things. Uh, I'm going to take a talk a little bit about some of the smaller presentation requirements that we had. We'll go back and visit Frank. Now, what's not showing here that I, I think I can affect with a change is the ability to customize warnings based on what the target audience setting is. And also to show access conditions. So I'll choose my form. We'll say for some reason this is deemed adult. And I'm going to enter a restriction in. And hopefully, based on the appearance of certain metadata in the record, the display will be changed. I need to wait for Solar to update that. OK, so now you see, based on the metadata that I entered, a couple of the display features have changed. I've said this might have adult content, so 
We're going to say that. And if there's an access restriction, it's the first thing that we show people. You can only look at this at lunchtime. We also built custom print options. So when you go to print a record, you get a choice of which parts of it that you want to print. We can include the metadata for the descriptive metadata. We can include the procedural transactions or not. We can include the image or not, and also choose to omit the list of collections. It's a good set of print customizations. You also see that we put in links for people to be able to buy a print that is not currently connected, but that's a forward-looking feature to be able to connect to a fulfillment service that will allow people to make purchases of assets. And then there's also a download feature. So currently, a lot of these will only show on the internal site, but um, not on the uh, on any external site until they're adapted. Now, the last topic I wanted to cover was integration with other applications. Um, we had a feature, we had a request for the whole to be able to run their MARC records through an authority checking uh, service that Backstage Library Works has. Now, this means we need the ability to find records that have been created since a given date, since this is a scheduled process, get them out, send them out to an outside service, and get them back in. So we built some special advanced search features. So this is an example of a way to set up a workflow in Islandora that round trips. I can look in collections. I'm looking down at the, uh, the mark export section of the advanced search form. And again, this is either shown or not based on your role. This will automatically give me a list of all the collections that have mark records. I can select the date that I want to do an export from, and that will prepare an export for me. Again, we leverage the bookmarks feature. So when an export is created, it'll say that's all done for you, and now it's listed in your bookmarks page. If I go to that bookmark, well, the list is empty at this time. I have the option to go ahead and export that. So when I export this list, I can send it to the authority service. And then we built an import mark XML authority records that allows them to zip up the returned files. And when that zip file is ingested, it will look at the PIDs that are embedded in the records. These are the identifiers for the records. And it will find those data streams and update them. Um, we also set up uh, an API access under the covers so that the main site at baseballhall.org, their Drupal system has access so that they can build stories and exhibits and online features by accessing content that is in Islandora. Likewise, the Beacon mobile app can access content that's in Mylandora. Um, we're integrated with Google Analytics, and I believe in the, feature, the, in the future they will use the OAI module to uh, set up access to federated search providers such as the Digital Public Library of America or other state libraries. That concludes a long tour. I'm sure there are many things still that I haven't shown you, but it should give you an idea of what a flexible framework this is and how we're able to come in, look at a really large project, and uh, come up with a set of customizations that works very well. So let's open up the floor for any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Very much, Stephen. I'll turn it over back to you. Insightful to uh, see and learn more about that project. As it was, as it was. Uh, I'll accept your question. So, roll. And uh, as, as you mentioned, if you want to explore any questions, if you want to type them in the chat window, we have about, we have about five minutes left here. Yeah, so we'll just wait for
There's a couple um, notes in the chat window from earlier on that they lost the sound, the audio earlier on. Um, rest assured, uh, everybody, 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 everybody on the uh, webinar that, 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 that recording, complete recording, the recording the audio. audio. While we're waiting for some questions, I'd like to talk about the next coming event that we're going to be on Saturday of Wednesday on November 30th. Uh, and the trip is the developing mail for Wish Discovery Garden. Hello, Island Girl. 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 I will include links to the link in the memo of the afterwards today. It doesn't look like there's going to be any questions generated, but as always, if you think of anything after the fact, uh, feel free to send me an email and I will uh, present the statement to the my answer. Um, to that end, thank you very much for joining us for our October webinar. Uh, stay tuned for details on our November webinar, November webinar which will be in our next newsletter. So thanks to so Stephen for this new presentation, and I hope you all have a great one. Thanks, everyone.